half in the bag. Isn't it about time they end this show? Oh my god. Holy shit. Oh. Oh my god. Uh, I can't believe that comic book nerd was in on the conspiracy to kill us. Jay, everyone's involved in a conspiracy to kill us. Oh man. We should make some phone calls to other VCR repairmen. Hmm, that's a good idea. See if they know anything about what's going on. Yeah. Oh shit, my phone's about to die. Oh. Hmm, I must have misplaced my phone. Oh, maybe I can get one call out. I'll call your phone and see if it's around here Okay, somewhere. yeah, maybe I dropped it. Right nearby. What? Oh, I ate it. I guess I thought it was food. Damn it, my phone just died. <sighs> who around here has a phone we could use? You realize whose house we're nearby, don't you? Something's different in here. Oh my god, you're right. Plinkett got rid of his little rug. What are you talking about? Look around. New furniture, HDTV, Blu-ray player. Is that a Roku? Hey, look, there's a note on the back of the door. Oh. Let's open up the note and read it to find out what it says. OK. Dear Harry, I must say I am so proud that you got rid of your old VCR and crappy television and made the big leap into HD TVs and Blu-ray. We had some great times together, Harry, especially all the awkward and terrible sex. Unfortunately, I don't think things will work out between us and I need to move on to the next phase of my life. I wish you the best. Love, Sheila. Sheila. There's something suspicious about all this. You're right, Jay, there is. But we came here to use the phone, and that's what we got to do. Right. Uh, let's start by calling Phil from Phil's Electronics on Broadway. That's a great idea. You know, Phil's a nice guy. I'd hate to see anything bad happen to him. Yeah. Oh, the phone just started ringing. Huh. Should I answer it? Yeah, answer the phone. Uh, okay. Hello? Hey, is this Mr. Harry S. Plinkett? Uh, uh pretend to be Plinkett. Oh, um... <clears throat> Yeah, this is Harry Ass Plinkett. Who is this? That's the worst Plinkett impression I've ever heard. He's gonna think you're a fake. Shut up! Well, Mr. Plinkett, this is Jabber from Jabber and the Man, WBBL Morning Radio. Congratulations! You and your lovely girlfriend, Sheila, have won tickets to an advanced screening of The Dark Knight Rises! Oh, thank you. Jay, find a wig. I'll explain on the way. There's a storm coming. You sound like you're looking forward to it. I'm adaptable. Hello and welcome to Half in the Bag. I'm Mike. And I'm Jay. And on this episode, we'll be talking about The Dark Knight Rises, which is the third and final film in the very popular series directed by Christopher Nolan. The movie is about Batman and the villainous Bane endlessly punching each other in the face. But it's also about Heath Ledger's dead and is not in the movie. So, Jay, what did you think of The Dark Knight Rises? Uh, you know, I was actually surprised by how much I enjoyed this movie. I, uh, what are you looking at? No, oh, uh, this, this TV feels weird. I guess that's kind of in the way, isn't I, it? I always have this weird feeling like whenever we talk about movies, someone's watching us. Yeah, I know what you mean. I get the same feeling, but it's a little bit different this time. It's like this TV is... is yeah, it's, is, a, it's a really ominous presence. Yeah, should we change our setup maybe? Yeah, let's move seats. Okay. Let's talk over here. So, you were saying? Uh, well, to, to briefly sort of uh, establish my relationship with this series of movies, I, I'm not the biggest fan of the Christopher Nolan Batman movies going into this. Why not? And I'm also not the biggest fan, really, of Christopher Nolan. Why not? We'll get into this later, I'm sure, but the the, the, the passionate love for him or the, the complete hate for him. There's both ends of the spectrum. I guess you could say I fall somewhere in the middle. So going into this movie, I, I didn't have really any expectations. I assumed it would be decent, but nothing beyond that. Um, that being said, I thought this movie fucking ruled. 
Wow, just, that's high praise. On a, on, a, on a pure, just sort of visceral level, on just a, a spectacle level, I, I was thoroughly entertained. Well, my general reaction is, and I agree with you, visceral and spectacle are, are good words to describe this movie. Um, I really like the movie as well. Uh, I, I would say almost as much as The Dark Knight, uh, maybe a teensy bit more. I, I would say the the Dark Knight is probably a better movie. It's a better film. Yeah. But this one I found more entertaining. Yeah. The Dark Knight, of course, everyone just goes straight to Heath Ledger. It's the Heath Ledger movie. Yeah. And and, and then you have the situation where it's like, well, okay, Heath Ledger's dead. Now what do you do? Like, how do you top that? The Joker's plan wasn't as grandiose or as destructive as Bane's plan. Um, so it's like, well, this movie, the the plot is bigger and more bigger things happen and. And it had the, the potential of really just turning into a clusterfuck or blowing up in their face. And I think it managed to rein it in and hold on the whole way through. I, I like that they didn't try and top it in that respect. Like a lot of people are saying, you know, even people that seem to like this movie are saying, well, it's really good, but it doesn't have as strong of a villain. Right. And I think Bane is a, a fine villain in this movie. It's not trying to outdo Heath yeah. Ledger. It's not trying to, to recapture that sort of spirit. It's a completely different animal altogether. This one kind of pulls the villain out a little and brings up all the other parts to, to stronger levels that were sort of lacking in The Dark Knight. It's the first Batman movie, not just in the, the Nolan movies, but in any Batman movie where I think I actually gave a shit about Batman. Yeah. That's the conundrum of all the Batman movies is that he's always the least interesting thing about them. He's broken in the beginning. He's kind of crippled. He's It's been eight years since the last movie. He's sort of out of the game and um, and he really has like a arc in this one yeah. that he really didn't, except for the first movie. And it's it's really the Dark Knight Rises. It's that's what the movie's about. So it does focus more on Batman, as a Batman movie should. What are you? I'm Gotham's reckoning. I would like to see a superhero movie with a smaller story. Um, I would like to see a Batman takes out this crime syndicate kind of story. But with this, they took it to, to the nth degree, which, which made it also work. Yeah. Because I was sort of like, I was a little disappointed in the, the MacGuffin bomb. The, uh, we have a wacky device that will see, that didn't bother do this. Me at all. It, it bothered me slightly. But all the other elements out outshined it, yeah. which was which was what made it work. If it was just that, yeah. Bane wants to take the bomb and put it up on top of the Statue of Liberty or this whatever, the <laughs> Statue of Gotham, um, and um, and blow it up and turn everyone into people with things on their mouth. <laughs> you know, like if it was something like that, I would have gone like, "Is this what Spider Man was?" Yeah, and I'm like, I'm so sick of this, but. They took it to such a level where where it becomes that, that's, just like yeah. apocalyptic event where the whole city is under siege and it, it, the, their way of life changes. The police are like this underground force, and it, it takes it out of control. And and that's why for me it's more entertaining than than the Dark Knight is just because for me personally yeah. that's the kind of thing that I think is interesting and yeah. cool is just seeing. Uh, I did compare it to Escape from New York, where the city's blocked off and just seeing. The, seeing a society just completely collapse. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons I'm interested in certain zombie movies too, is yeah. just seeing a society completely in ruins and, and how people deal with it and survive. And uh, and yeah, it, it's 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 epic in this movie, which is, is the only way you can go with the previous Nolan movies. They've been constantly ramping up. Uh, there's nowhere to go with this, so I guess they have to reboot it at this point because you can't get any <laughs> Batman in space, maybe? Maybe they'll shoot Batman into space. It's the true completion. I won't bury you. Buried enough members of the Wayne family. It takes everything to a whole new level. We were in this together. What was neat to see in this one, too, was that because the first two just sort of feel like two separate Batman stories. Mm -hmm. And this one sort of takes elements from each of those two earlier movies and, and uh, adds to it and yeah. combines it. So the whole series of three movies sort of gets wrapped up in a nice little bow. It all sort of ties together. Well, overall, I think it's safe to say we both really liked Batman uh, Forever. What is this movie called? It's a quality production. It's, it's sort of just like this big 
clunky, loud, awesome thing. <laughs> I think that's the best way to describe it. Sure, it's not sure. it's not perfectly beveled on all the corners. It's not shiny. It's not flawless. It's a movie that is really eager to please. It, it made me think of like the old like golden uh, age of Hollywood movies, like the big musicals and the big spectacle films with hundreds of extras and dance numbers yeah. and it's like we're trying, really. We're trying so hard to entertain you. When on the on the opposite end of that, Spider-Man feels like a cheaply made piece of crap. Well, and that's the thing is like, you know, Dark Knight Rises, it's not a perfect movie. It has problems. I would say the biggest one for me is that it starts off a little clunky. The first act or so of the movie is, is it takes you a while to kind of get into what's going on because there's a lot of characters and there's a lot of things in the air. It's a little jumbled, but once all those pieces are in place, uh, I, I say it's smooth sailing. Everybody has their assignments. Everybody has things to do. There's nice little uh, revelations throughout the story to keep you engaged. Mm -hmm. Some of them are predictable, some not so much, but at least they're there. Yeah. It's not, uh, the lizard wants to turn people into lizard people. Spider-Man has to stop yeah. him, and then that's it. Well, I will acknowledge your point, but I don't agree with it mm. that the beginning was clunky. I thought it was fine, mm. like as far, it, the pacing was fine. It's just, it was so long since the last film, and not in our terms, but in the movie terms, it's been eight years. So there was all these scenes and things and you sort of have to get reacclimated to what's going on. Like Bruce Wayne is a shut-in and you know, this person's in charge of the, the Harvey Dent has died and all this stuff you have to kind of get into. And, and that was fine and it's so long until you see the Batman come back. And yeah. that's what was great. The rest of the time it's focused on Bruce Wayne. It's focused on you know, Bane, all these other characters. Mm -hmm. Bruce Bane, don't forget about him. Bruce Bane? I don't remember Bruce. He's, he was a, a character in there and it, it got confusing after a while because they didn't know if they were talking about Bruce Wayne or Bane. Mm. There's a guy named Bruce Bane in the movie. It's like, whose fucking idea was that? That seems like a horrible decision. Yeah, yeah. That Christopher Nolan's an overrated heck. He is, he is. And there's another character named Bruce Banner, which is like, it was unrelated, it was spelled differently. And then the part of the movie where they all traveled to Brisbane, Yes. Oh my God. Bruce Bane and Brisbane with Bruce Wayne and Bruce Banner. And they're all watching uh, basketball. So let's talk about the actors briefly. Okay. Before we get into the meat of this review and bitch about plot holes. Um, uh, when I first heard that Anne Hathaway was cast in the movie, it, I had the same reaction when I heard that Heath Ledger was cast in the movie. It's like, Heath Ledger is the Joker, what? Yeah. And then. He turned out to be brilliant, and then Anne Hathaway turns out to be brilliant as well. That's why I wasn't concerned about her being Catwoman. Yeah. I was like, you know what, at this point, he's, he's earned my trust. Right, so right. you got to give him the benefit of the doubt. I was like, Anne Hathaway, the girl that ruined the Oscars? <laughs> the only one I didn't like was that guy that played the other, the police commissioner, the other police commissioner. Oh, Matthew Modine. He was just like shouting his lines, and it's just like bad. Well, he was just sort of there. I mean, that whole character was kind of pointless. And that would be one complaint I'd have is that there's just probably too many characters. Yeah. I did think it was pretty cool to see uh, Tom Lennon show up for a oh, scene. Oh, yeah. And I also like that he played a doctor, because then in my brain, I like to imagine that uh, even though in What's Your Number, he was a gynecologist, I still I'd like to pretend that it's the same character and that What's Your Number exists in the same universe as Batman. Tom Lennon just goes, it's like, the weirdos I see at my hospital. Barry, it's Allie. Oh, we dated for like three months. I have seen worse cartilage on these. Scar tissue on your kidneys. I cannot recommend that you go hella skinny. And then of course, um, Tom Hardy as the Bane. Yeah. Who, who we all know Tom Hardy, who got his acting career started in Star Trek Nemesis as the Shinzon. Oh, Shinzon. Good old Shinzon. Kill everything on that ship. Who sounded like Dr. Evil in that movie, and, and Bane sounds like Dr. Evil too. Right, girl, I'm Dr. Evil. And it's like, oh no! See, and to me, he, it felt like his accent kept changing throughout this movie. Yeah. And in some parts, he sounded like Sean Connery talking through a tin can. And then there were other parts where I had no idea what the fuck he was saying. I, I, I really liked the Bane voice. I, I See, I thought it was, came off comical in a lot of scenes. But Well, you know, hey. It sounded like a prank phone call voice to me. Like when you get a prank phone call with someone with a voice changer, where it sounds like, I've got the money. Meet me at the corner of the whatever street. And if you want to see your daughter alive. <laughs> like, and, and it, where it's, it's not just like a movie voice. Like a typical movie would be like, he needs to sound like a, like a really evil monster. Run, Bane, Bane. 
but it, it, it was so strange that it made it creepy. Yeah, yeah I'd agree. That, it was that's strange. That's just my personal I, I would say to me, what made it more off putting was the fact that it was so like forefront in the soundtrack. Yeah. It wasn't like mixed in a way where it matched other the volume of other characters. It was right. just, it, it was it's distorted, commanding. but it was very clean. Yeah. And that was off putting to me. It was a commanding voice. And I think the reason why it was so loud and it wasn't like, mixed into the soundtrack in the background like it bane's far away it's quieter you know i think it's just like whenever he spoke it's like you knew he was the guy like i'm bane and, he, and he's the guy in charge and I, I think that was a stylistic choice you know what my favorite line of dialogue by bane in this movie was what was that when he said <laughs> that was my favorite line too yeah a close second was when he said <laughs> Did you say sit on my face? Well, that's what he said. Oh, I think that was Anne Hathaway who said that. Oh. You sure it wasn't the, the homeless guy that was sitting behind you in the theater? <laughs> Why didn't you just kill me? Your punishment must be more severe. So Bane came from the same place that Shinzon did, <laughs> which I was laughing at. I was like, Bane was born in like a hellish prison world underground and there's like, a big tunnel to escape from, and it's the same thing in Star Trek Nemesis. Do you think Christopher Nolan was influenced by Star Trek Nemesis? I think I think he watched it and said, "That's my bane." That's the new. That's the next Adam Sandler film. That's my bane. That's my bane. Starring Adam Sandler and Tom Hardy as Bane. Dude, get a bar the core. Selena Kyle has her own code of ethics, which sometimes involves doing things that other people might consider questionable. Yeah, I love the Catwoman in this movie. She's really good. Yeah, she's really good. She's really good. And they didn't overdo her. Well, they never even call her Catwoman. And I like yeah. the fact that her little goggles are what make her little cat ears. Yeah, she yeah. Flips her them down. Night vision like, goggles. That's, that's, makes sense in the Christopher Nolan more real version of Batman. Yeah, so. yeah. She has a cat burglar outfit, but they don't like, you know, kind of. They, they they have one shot where she walks around the Bat mo motorcycle, and you see kind of her doing a little sexy walk, but they don't over exploit her no. her figure or show her ass all the time or anything like too um, goofy like that. And you barely see her in the cat suit. Yeah, it's more about her character, and and the same with uh, all the other characters in this movie. It's the that and that's what makes the costumes and the superheroism and all that goofy stuff in it work is yeah. it's, it's because it's supplemental. It's not primary. Yeah. Um, unlike the Spider-Man movie. Well, and there's they no tried it with the Spider-Man movie, but yeah, it, it, it was like they fell on their fucking face. Well, and there's no no show-offy moments in this. No. Like everything feels very natural, and it's all in service of the story. Right. Like the first time Batman does show up after whatever 45 minutes or an hour into the movie, there's not that like hero shot. Mm -hmm. He just sort of, you see him, the back of his, his vehicle, and then he's just standing there holding his gun. You're like, there's Batman. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's almost more exciting than if they did the, cause that's the thing, another, you know, we both, I think like the Avengers, but that's a movie that is nothing but like nerdgasm shots. The, the, the famous one where it's going around all the characters, everything in that is a big, like, look at this. These guys are awesome. And this is much more subdued and natural. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to bring up the Avengers because when you're talking about this movie versus that movie, they're two movies that work in their own style. Yeah. Um, but they're on such opposite ends of the spectrum yeah. of what you can do with a comic book superhero movie. And then right in the middle, you have uh, The Amazing Spider-Man. So you have, you have the Avengers, which is goofy, colorful, unrealistic, show-off-y. And then you have Batman, which is a little more darker, realistic. And then in the middle... They tried to do a Spider-Man that was closer to Dark Knight, but... But you still have a giant lizard monster. But you still have those goofy elements that you have, like Joss Whedon knew exactly what to do with that material. Christopher Nolan knows exactly what to do with his material. And then they picked, you know, the best guy possible, Mark Webb, to handle that material. I, they, I, I, the only one that could have done a better job would have been Brett Ratner. Yeah. If you're looking for total mediocrity and someone that'll just be subservient to the studio, like he's the guy you go to. I think he called Brett Ratner for advice, like on the big night before a shoot. It's yeah. Brett, Brett, how do I make this as bad as I can? And Brett Ratner's like, let me just tell you, I got all sorts of tricks. Do whatever they tell you to do. Make it look like the other movie. And then just cash that paycheck, Webb. Do you think he's coming back? I don't know. Continued in part two.